Did you know that over a million Americans are dying annually of just heart disease and cancer alone? Do our doctors know the cause? Join us for the next 30 minutes of eye-opening science. Hi, I'm Dr. John Trowbridge from Houston, Texas. Over two dozen years ago, I wrote the Yeast Syndrome book. But 30 years ago, I met Doug Kaufman. He's wonderful, he can help you know the cause. Here's my good friend, Doug. One of my favorite doctors there, Dr. John Trowbridge from Houston, Texas. Welcome aboard, friends. Thank you for being with us today. Producer John Miller and Kyle and I went to lunch the other day, and Kyle and I began talking about fungus, about healthcare, et cetera. And John said, we should record this and have a free-for-all television show where you guys just sit and talk. Kyle. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle is here today. What he's not telling you, though, is that this is how we've done a few shows in the past. Yep. We had to tape something quickly, and so, and some of the best shows were the ones that we didn't actually plan and we just kind of talked through. So that might be a lot of fun today. I mean, gluten. If the jury is still out on gluten. What about intermittent fasting, right? We got a quiz. All sorts of fun things are going to happen on today's Know the Cause. We don't even know what, so stay tuned. You know, John Miller, our producer, tells me all the time, people write in, and thank you for writing in, a lot of you want to know my take on the Affordable Care Act. And I gotta tell you, I haven't done what Nancy Pelosi said. I haven't read it. <laughs> I have no idea what it says. She said, first we gotta pass it in order to read it and, and see what we think of it. Uh, Kyle, I'm the kind of guy who sees what's going on currently in medicine, yeah. and I'm uncomfortable with it. Yeah. I really am. I think the plight is to get us on so many medicines because, in all honesty, pharmaceutical companies now teach doctors and nurses continuing medical education. So there's an uncomfortableness there, and I think a real conflict of interest there, that drug companies, do you think diet comes up? Do you think fungus comes up? All that comes up is new drugs, new drugs, new drugs. So I think there's a horrible conflict for we, the patients. Uh, so along comes this new Affordable Care Act. First of all, I have to question the word affordable based on what I've seen so far. Uh, but there's two of me. One that says anything's got to be better than what we have now, mm. and one that says this is a train wreck, like I'm hearing on TV. Uh, this isn't going to work. Mm. It's a, it, it might be a great thing to roll your sleeves up and try and attack it, but it's not going to work. I'm afraid of it. Well, here's one of my several takes, but the, the main one is this. I am a natural medicine guy. I like traditional Chinese medicine, for example, Ayurvedic medicine, Western herbalism. There's thousands of healing traditions, hundreds of which are very popular around the world. Homeopathy. Homeopathy yeah. and yeah. herbalism are the two most popular around the world, and yet what this law does is it says, no, no, the only one that counts is Western drug and surgery and radiation medicine. And we'll We'll put together a plan for, for, for that to be paid for. I gotta tell you, for somebody like myself who tries to opt out of that, except in extreme cases like emergency surgery or uh, my wife had a C-section, thank goodness for it when we needed it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of wanting to make this my standard go-to health strategy, it's not mine. I don't want it. I want something else. And so I don't like that I'm forced into that particular thing. But the other thing that I'm concerned about is something that Dr. Greg Emerson told us that he says that living in Australia under a system kind of like what we just passed, the wait times to see a doctor or to get simple tests, things that you and I could probably get this afternoon, are, are literally three and four years long waiting to get certain tests that are pretty simple right now in America. So these are the things that I'm concerned about along with several other things, but those are the top level things. Kyle, here's where I think this is headed. Yeah. 
currently we have a choice to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. Yeah. And I know pediatricians don't want to hear this, nurses and doctors don't want to hear this, but we have a choice. That's okay, mm -hmm. I believe. We have choices, elective surgery it's called. You can have it or you don't have to have it. Yeah. There are so many choices that we have. Uh, do I want to take a statin drug? You know, doc, I don't think 201 is high enough. I don't want to take a statin drug. We can tell our doctors no. I see in this affordable care, we don't get those choices anymore. Your cholesterol is 201, you're going to take the statin drug, but it might kill me. There are side effects. It doesn't matter, then you know, you're killed. I, I see this trend vaccinations. Mm. You know what? I haven't had a vaccine for, you know, <laughs> since I went to Vietnam. Don't now, say that out loud. I know, I just yeah. admitted it. Now I'm probably 15 vaccines behind. Yeah. And when this Affordable Care Act comes on, Will we all be mandated things we currently have the freedoms to say, I don't think I want to take that pill? Yeah. I, I, chemotherapy. You, chemotherapy, Kyle. I was listening to a doc, uh, or to a uh, roundtable with yeah. a bunch of physicians being asked this, these same questions. And one of the doctors said, you know what, I've just stopped even being part of that system. I just do a regular fee for service. It's really about a third of the cost that we were doing it when we were doing through insurance. One of the strategists who was very pro Affordable Care Act said, well, listen, doc, you're not going to be able to keep your license if you keep doing that. In other words, if you're a doctor, you're not going to be able to treat patients the way that you currently want to treat them. You're going to be given a standard that may, may or may not be what you, the patient, are really in agreement with philosophically. So there, there are so many problems, as far as I'm concerned, as a natural health guy, that I'm concerned. Will you still have access to herbs and homeopathic remedies and so forth? Yes, but financially, what will that mean? What if now I'm spending $1,500 a month on a plan and that $1,500 used to go to herbs mm -hmm. or organic food or something like that. It's a matter of choice now. And you think about something that's going to suppress fungus very quickly because this is not yeah. common. Doctors yeah. don't know about fungus. It's going to be socialism. And that, I'm afraid, is where this is headed. What about gluten sensitivity or gluten enteropathy? Don't go away. We'll be right back and discuss that. In 1993, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Growing up, I didn't really take care of myself. And then when I started to want to have children, people would come up and say, are you even going to be able to have children? And that would really discourage me. And in about 2005, I was watching Doug Kaufman, and everything just started to change. The sugar got under control, and um, everything just started to come alive for me. I felt better, and um, in 2007, I had my first daughter, and in 2008, a second daughter, and 2012, our third. So we've been blessed. Follow Doug's phase one diet as closely as possible. Olive leaf extract, the oregano oil. Caprylic acid was one of the first I ever took. Prayer, of course, that can be done. You need to just, you need to revamp your body to, to prepare itself for pregnancy, and that'll make it easier. Here's an article that just came out. Didn't we do a little segment today on Obamacare? Obamacare failure may shave 30% from pharmaceutical sales, says a new article. It says potential shortfalls in enrollment in President Barack Obama's health care overhaul would put a 30% dent in projections for U.S. prescription drug sales in 2017, a report shows. The worst case scenario, they say, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to smirk, the worst case scenario would translate to $320 billion in drug spending in the year 2017. $320 billion in the U.S. That's not worldwide, in the U.S. The best case scenario, which would be great for everybody, I happen to question that, is it good for we, the patients? Uh, the best care is supposed to be $460 billion demanded by the health care laws, expansion of insurance coverage, and medical screenings. I'm telling you folks, what they want more than anything is to put you in a line, have you walk forward, put your arm out for blood, do all these medical tests, and then say, you got a health problem, go on these medicines. But I think one of the most striking things here, you have to understand, look, the pharmaceutical companies have a lot to make as Obamacare crosses all of these hurdles. One thing that they said here, global spending on drugs for the first year in 2014 is expected to surpass one 
trillion dollars. That's more than I have in the bank. I mean, that's a serious number, one trillion dollars. Here's the take home message if there is one here. I am now 64 years old. I feel great. I don't take any medication. I take a lot of supplements. We really have to think our way through this, folks. If you eat differently than most 64-year-old people, if you exercise differently than more, most 64-year-old people, and if you take supplements meant to kill fungus and help your immune system, that's what I think good health is all about. But once again, just let me remind you, just my take. My name's Shannon Mitchell, and I live in Springfield, Missouri. I got diagnosed with prostate cancer about six years ago, and I went to a meeting with Don Strom in Arkansas, one of Doug Kaufman's meetings, and I've followed the phase one protocol for now about six years. And uh, most of the people I know that tried other methods that had it, they're not here, and I am. I'm leaner and a lot more muscular. Anytime that I cheat, you can tell a difference. And usually, I, you know, the diet itself corrects me pretty quick because I know that, well, I'm doing something I shouldn't do because I uh, don't feel good. Well, I'd recommend that they look into this uh, very seriously. I think it's uh, the best alternative i found to uh, radiation or chemotherapy. And uh, I, I didn't want to try those. The, the meeting that Don talked me to in Arkansas, Doug, Doug, uh, Doug's meeting, was an answer to prayer. Hi, I'm Susie Cohen, America's Pharmacist, and I want to tell you about some incredible health benefits that you can get from beta-glucans. Who can benefit from a glucan? You can. <laughs> that was corny. Beta-glucans are glucose polymers, which occur naturally in the foods we eat, but it's also sold as a dietary supplement. A 2007 Kansas University study found that beta-glucans can slow the spread of tumors by supercharging the protective components of your immune system. Pretty cool, huh? Now, if you have to have chemotherapy, ask your oncologist about beta-glucan because research suggests it could improve the effect of your chemo and give your immune system a boost at just the right time. Impressive, huh? Some of you take cholesterol medicine, so pay attention now. Beta-glucan has been shown to support healthy cholesterol levels, and when you normalize fats in the body, you lose some. All these benefits with very few, if any, side effects. I just love to think outside the pill. Okay, welcome back, friends. Thank you so much. Now that we've resolved all the problems with the Affordable Care Act, <laughs> how I wish, salute. you know, the sad thing about that, Kyle, I'm not prepared to read 30,000 pages. Yeah. And that's not like me to jump into something and say, okay, I'm in with both feet without reading it. That's It'd be true. like taking a test in college when you didn't even buy the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're asking us to do. And I feel just so awkward saying, okay, here's my health and my life. It now doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to a doctor. Well, I remember when we were uh, working here with a, a person who was gonna come in as a sponsor of the show. And they said, hey, we just have some herbs and everything. And they just sent like a contract. And we didn't even have a chance to read, you know, what their products are. Well, of yeah. course, you're not. And they were, I remember trying to pressure you yeah, yeah. Into, into saying yes to them to come on for some, you Wouldn't know, be such ridiculous good money. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the money made you go, ooh, I should listen to this. Yeah. And yet they were trying to force it down our throats. And it turns out that the products were not good at all. Yeah, you have to, look, you've got to read. You've got to know what we've gotten into. Now, yeah. gluten sensitivity. Okay, <laughs> in the 1970s, I was working with Howard Gottschalk in Los Angeles, ear, nose, and throat allergist. Uh, he sent me off to the Washington University School of Medicine somewhere mm. to learn food allergy. Somewhere around that time, I remember coming home and I learned a brand new word. Here I was in <laughs> food allergy, I knew wheat, Right? I didn't know this word gluten, gluten, nor the word gliadin. Right? Apparently these are two proteins in wheat. All, but here's what I do know. I didn't know it then, I know it today. I know that our wheat supply in America is commonly, commonly contaminated with mold that will make you very, very sick. So along comes a fraction 
of wheat. I don't care if there's 50 fractions. If I tell you to stay off the smallest fraction, you're going to say, I can't do that, but I'll stay off the wheat itself. <laughs> and you're going to say, my gosh, that tiny fraction was it. I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. Why? You're off wheat. <laughs> Your exposure to mycotoxins is now minimized. You're feeling so much better. But Kyle knows why so many people on gluten-sensitive diets do well for a month mm. or two and then head downhill. Yeah, we've seen it over and over again. When people get on a gluten-free diet, and initially their symptoms go down, and they're going, man, finally I found it. But then the symptoms start coming back up again. Here's one of the reasons why. When you first start doing gluten-free, you know, you're trying it, so you just stop eating grain altogether, anything like that. And as the symptoms start improving, you go, gosh, I'm going to get everything I can that's gluten-free because there's gluten-free pancake mix and gluten-free pasta and gluten-free everything, and it's everywhere, so I can buy it at Walmart or the health food store any place. Well, what you don't know is that many of these, most of these gluten-free products, yeah, they're not made with wheat, but they're made with corn with potatoes, with various starches that are part of that study that Doug just referenced that showed they were commonly or even in some cases universally contaminated with mycotoxins. So the more of these mycotoxin-laden grains that they begin eating in the place of wheat, the more the symptoms start coming back up again. Uh, uh, Kyle, yeah. sugar is gluten-free. So <laughs> right, what happens right, right. is we're eating all these sweet things because on the label, it's all marketing, folks. And I know many of you have taken this very hard, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to be that way. I've been at this twice, right? Once back in the 70s. Here it is again. It'll run a five-year. This time it's got doctors attracted to it yeah. because there's a test. I wrote this blog Please, it was one of the most important blogs I ever wrote. Gluten sensitivity versus mycotoxin exposure. It's not long, it's a couple of paragraphs, but you really responded favorably to this. All of a the sudden, there's a test for it. It's called an anti-gliadin antibody test, a blood test. There are actually three or four different tests. IgG positive to anti-gliadin antibodies, and that's a big way of talking about immunology. But what it says is a little bit of gluten is leaking through the gut. So if I stop eating gluten, won't a little bit of milk or a little bit of cabbage or a little bit of carrot juice leak through the gut? You must seal up the gut. How does the gut get impregnated like that? There are pictures, big microscopy pictures, showing yeast themselves embedding in the walls of the gut and poking holes through. So out goes the gluten. Now everybody's got a gluten <laughs> problem. I mean, it's amazing to me. Yes, stay off of wheat. Why? Because of the gluten fraction or a blood test told you that you have gut permeability? What in the world does that have to do with gluten? Please, I like the idea of staying away from grains and feeling great. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Don't go away. More of this potpourri coming up next. <laughs> You know, Denny, I think the favorite food of Americans is Mexican food. I think you're you right. You ask your friends, okay, Italian food, yeah, Mexican food, everybody wants, but there's margaritas and there's corn and flour and so forth, and they're not allowed on the phase one diet. So you came, if that induction unit works for us, this is a little experiment here, right. uh, then we're going to make something more like a crepe, but it's a taco. A, tor idea. a tortilla, tortilla, yeah, and it is it is kind of like a crepe. Um, the difference is it has a little bit of body to it. So we've got yeah. some coconut flour and and some almond flour, um, eggs, um, and I, I got this recipe from a cookbook and was so excited about it because the difference between this and a crepe is that with these these little additions here, they give it a whole lot more. Um, structure and it doesn't fall apart as easily as a crepe so you can actually use it to wrap some sure. meat, um, guacamole, salsa, whatever you want to put in it. So let's yeah. blend this up really quick. I'm loud. not going to talk while you're doing this. Okay. okay. And we've got a skillet over here. It should be on about medium high heat and I've oiled it with a little coconut oil. Okay. Look at that. Oh, that does remind me of a crepe. And then what do you put? You put this 
this sure. into well, you could, it. You could put brisket. anything. You could put anything. You could also use it to make just sandwiches. You could use it for you know chicken salad or turkey or any, anything you would have a normally make a wrap out of. Sure. So instead of a taco shell, uh, you right. make it phase one. Use this sure. for the shell. We, right. Okay. Right. Good. So we've got some shredded beef and some salsa and some guacamole. Good, okay. Yeah. What, what the show is all about is trying to teach you to eat phase one friendly, right? Phase one eating does two things simultaneously. Number one, it stops feeding parasites, fungi in your body. And number two, it provides you with great nutrition. Yeah, it just smells so good in here. How's it doing? It's ready. Oh, look at that. It does look like a crepe, Denny. Looks exactly like a crepe, okay. And once again, this is Mexican food that doesn't have the corn and flour and all the other uh, stuff that isn't approved on the phase one diet. This is phase one crepe or well, phase one taco. A tortilla, yeah. We don't, we, I suppose uh, crepes are more French, so we probably ought to okay. call them tortillas, <laughs> but it, it, you're right though, it is a crepe, And it looks to be so easy to make, so inexpensive, again, um, and again, you know, with the eggs, it's, it has protein in it too, so that's good. One of these and for added lunch plus. or dinner, Denny is. Oh yeah. You know, is Only get one. It done. I'm sitting here salivating while she's mixing this up. Okay, roll this baby up. Do I eat it like a crepe, you or should I eat it like a taco? Should I eat it like a man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, look at that. Mm. And can you imagine it with filled with other things too? I mean, there's, you could put anything in there, right? You like it this way? Absolutely delicious. Highly recommend it. Try this. Thank you. Okay. You know, I personally haven't fasted a lot. Three or four days I might go and then I see something that looks really good, a green apple or something, and I just go for it and there goes my diet. But we've had pets all through the years. When the kids were small, we always had dogs and now we have a couple of cats. And I notice when they don't feel well, they don't mm. eat. Yeah. You know, they'll drink a little water, but you'll put out a steak or something for them and that big old dog just lays down, it doesn't want to eat. So I know there's something to it over and above just staying away from food. Yeah, and I'm just gonna pull out the whiteboard to show you the idea that we're, uh, that we're gonna be talking about. There's a lot of questions about something called intermittent fasting. Okay. This is not the several days in a row fasts that we've all been used to. Really, all that intermittent fasting is, is just decreasing the number of hours each day that you eat. In other words, there's 24 hours in a day, and so you can do variations of this. You can go 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of eating. Eight hours? Just eight, so between the hours of say oh, noon I see. to eight. I see, you don't right? eat for eight hours. No, no, yeah. but just during that window is the only time that you're eating at all, Okay. all right? Gotcha. Other ones that are uh, shortening the, the window that we eat, 18 hours of fasting, six hours. And then there's some that are actually doing 20 hours of fasting every single day and eating only during a four hour window each day. Now these are being popularized by a couple of different researchers. There's Brad Pilon who wrote a book called Eat, Stop, Eat. And <laughs> it is name. very popular now and I've read it and I love it. I think it's yeah. very interesting. He isn't talking about food choices like antifungal this or that. He's just simply talking about the hours of the day that you eat and that's it. And with, he, with the goal in mind of what, Kyle, lose weight or? Weight is only one thing. There's a lot, Martin Berkman, uh, Berkham uh, talks about actually gaining weight if you're a bodybuilder. So it's coming at it from two different okay. angles. But one of the big things is that Pilon and all researchers are talking about is something called autophagy. Autophagy is how the body begins to clean up its own disgusting dead cells. And when you fast, for about 14 to 16 hours at a time, the autophagy just sets off and it's almost like a detoxification. It's been, uh, it's been studied for longevity benefits. Hmm. It's been studied for all of the weird chemical reactions that nobody ever talks about but has everything to do with detoxing and longevity and it seems that intermittent fasting is hitting all of the marks. 
I gotta tell you, I've done this a little bit just to experiment. I've done each of these, the 16 hour, mm -hmm. the 18 mm -hmm. hour, the 20 hour. 20 hours kind of tough, yeah. right? But I can't eat breakfast anymore since doing this. I have never I simply been a big, don't you know, do I'll it. I'll have a juice or half a grapefruit. I kind of, now, take in mind the phase one diet. You so bet. So eating the right foods, I'll have lunch with John, we eat a phase one salad, yep. and then if I could get an early dinner, yes. you know, uh, at four o'clock, I'd be living within this, noon and then four, Doug, and I'm that's done. it? Because that's what I would do. I'm telling you, Kyle, there's, there might be something to this, allowing your body a break. Look, it's biblical. Yes. I mean, you know, they talked about fasting a long time Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. And I really, I like this idea. I like I think, it too. And you've done it. And yeah, I've done it. Uh, our buddy Chris, uh, the director, uh, has done it. We talk about this a lot and email and text each other about this very concept. And we are liking it. A lot of these, I should tell you though, are saying eat anything you want during that yeah, window. Yeah. I'm telling you, phase one plus this could be magic. See, I'm going to try pizza and beer for four hours only <laughs> and see if I feel as good as I've ever felt. You Thank don't. you for joining us, folks. Don't go away. We have a quiz coming up next. Thank you for being with us. The same book that taught me that my people perish for lack of knowledge, God said this, also teaches in the Old Testament there are 32 references to not using yeast. This show, as you now know, is all about mold, mildew, and fungus. Well, if you have a fungal condition, know that we feed it. What foods feed fungus? Know that there are safe supplements to help remediate it inside your body, and lifestyle plays a great role in eliminating it. How do you learn more about what we're teaching here? Go to my website, knowthecause.com. Well, thank you so much, Dr. John Trowbridge, for opening today's show. Did you see that text he sent me? Oh, that was nice. Just unbelievable. Uh, More research. Yeah, exactly. Susie, thank you. Beta-glucan, big time. I love beta-glucan. <laughs> thank you for coming in and being thank with us. Thank you so much. That new uh, Eat, it, Stop, it, Eat. Yeah, I intermittent read fasting. That. That's kind of interesting. I love it. You marry that to the phase one diet. That's what I think. And I think you've got some serious That's healing special. going on. Finally, this one again. I didn't read this before it went up. So <laughs> yeah, right during like the break, it. I did. Uh, yes. Dr. J. Walter Wilson, well-known. Pulmonary coccidiomycosis. That means lung fungus. Is far from rare. Although today, doctors say it's extremely rare. But most physicians diagnose it as what? A cold, influenza, asthma, or both A and B. Oh, you've got that lung thing going. <coughs> and these people live in Arizona yep. and Southern California yep. where all those winds blow all of that endemic, right, mold into their lungs. And the doctors are saying, oh, you just have a cold or a little influenza. And I'll bet they then say, you didn't take the flu shot, did you? Oh. You've got to take that flu shot, and here it has nothing to do it with the virus. It happens in a child. Oh, did you not immunize your yes. kids? It's just, right. Come on, don't get me started. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. This was potpourri. <laughs> this was a free-for-all. John, you did a very good job in there. I really like sitting here with Kyle and learning and, and educating. If you guys like the show, visit our website. Uh, honor the people that advertise on Know the Cause. Keep us on the air. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, folks, for watching. God bless each and every one of you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.